When the Soviets launched Sputnik into space, we jump-started our space program and our investment in science and math education. My brother and I were Sputnik kids. My brother Owen was 11, and I was 6 when Sputnik was launched. My parents took us into the living room and sat us down and told the two of us that we had to study math and science in order to beat the Soviets. I thought that was an awful big burden to place on an 11-year-old and a 6-year-old. But we were obedient sons, and so we studied math and science. And wouldn't you know it, my parents were right. We beat the Soviets. The space program created all kinds of dividends in technology and to our economic development. I watched the Senate debate last fall in which this, the Republican candidate said that the government had never created a job. The debate, of course, was broadcast by satellite. I think you get the idea. The fact is, the investments we made in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s in science and technology, in our state universities, and in infrastructure that was the envy of the world, brought our debt as a percentage of GDP from 121% in 1945 to 33% in 1980. Erskine Bowles was right. We can't get out of our current debt with growth alone. But I will tell you most certainly that we will not get out of it without growth. And so we have to choose wisely in what we invest in, in when we invest, and in how we invest, in what we cut, and when we cut, and how we cut, which we must do, and in how we increase our revenues, and when we increase our revenues, and from whom we get those revenues. Why not invest in retrofitting buildings when we have so many in the building trades out of work, sitting on the sidelines and knowing that we can recoup that investment in energy savings within three to five years? Let's find creative ways of financing that, like PACE financing, which lets families get a loan from their local government and pay it back on their property tax. This is how cities pay for street lights and sidewalks. It adds value to homes, and when the family moves, the loan stays with the property. We should also create incentives for banks to lend to small businesses for retrofitting commercial buildings. There's a company in Minnesota called McQuay that makes heating and air conditioning systems for commercial buildings. They're actually supplying the system for the new World Trade Center in Faribault, Minnesota. And their systems are so energy efficient that they pay for themselves in three to five years through energy savings. They've been taking out loans from banks since they're a large credit-worthy company, and then they give out loans to customers who install their systems. It's win-win. Because they're selling more units and putting people back to work, and their customers are actually making money in the long run through energy savings. McQuay has a good model, and we should be figuring out how to encourage others to do the same thing. Win-win. Return on investment. Why not cut our defense spending when $100 billion in cuts have been identified by our service chiefs at Secretary Gates' request, and when cost overruns on our Weapon systems are absurdly high. The GAO recently revealed that when you add up the growth in costs of major defense weapon systems over their original estimates, the total is over $402 billion. Why not raise revenue by increasing taxes on the wealthiest in this nation, those who have benefited the most from the economy in recent years, especially when we can look to the recent past and see that there tax cuts virtu uh, added virtually no jobs and contributed mightily to our deficit. Only when the middle class is strong does our economy grow, because the middle class has always been the part of our society that creates demand. There just aren't enough rich people to buy enough stuff. The middle class spends its money. 
But today, companies are sitting on trillions of dollars because there's just not enough demand. And that's because there's a lot of unemployment and because wages for the middle class have gone down over the last decade. Creating a middle class is not an end unto itself. A strong middle class leads to strong consumer spending and therefore to a strong economy and to national prosperity. The middle class is also where you get entrepreneurs. Much higher percentage of the middle class become entrepreneurs than any other class in this country. It's where you get small businesses. The middle class is an engine to our economy. Why not invest in early childhood education when we know that the return on quality early childhood education is up to $16 for every dollar spent. We know that children who have had quality early childhood education are less likely to need special education. They are less likely to repeat grades. They, are, they have better health outcomes. That the girls are less likely to get pregnant as teenagers. We know that children who have had quality early edu uh, childhood education are more likely to graduate from high school, more likely to go to college, and more likely to get a good job and pay taxes, and much less likely to go to prison. My friends on the other side say that we must cut the deficit for our children's sake, and I I agree. But then why are such a disproportionate amount of the cuts aimed at programs that help children? As I said, one of every five children in America lives in poverty, and that's an even greater percentage in rural areas. But the Republicans want to cut Head Start, an early Head Start. We currently serve about 40 percent of the children who qualify for Head Start, and less than 4% of the children who qualify for early Head Start. Do we really want to cut that? Do we really want to cut Pell Grants? The Republican budget slashes Medicaid. About 50% of the recipients of Medicaid are children, like Evelyn. We know we're going to have to make shared sacrifices to get the budget under control, but do we really think that sick kids are the ones that should make those sacrifices? You know, immediately after this election, Republican leadership said that their number one priority was seeing to it that Barack Obama is a one-term president. They didn't say that their number one priority was getting Americans back to work or educating our kids or even balancing the budget. Their number one priority was winning the next election. But I don't think that's what Americans want. The American people want us to get to work, to solve problems, to improve their lives. We don't have to agree on how to do that. But they sent us here to work together. If the time between elections just becomes about jockeying for the next election, then what in the world is the point of getting elected in the first place? I thought we were here to work together constructively in the interest of the American people. Now the Senate Republican leader is saying that raising any revenue at all is off the table, that he will not vote to raise the debt ceiling if part of our compromise on the budget going forward involves any tax increase on anyone, no matter how wealthy they are, no matter what their income. I ask my colleagues, for the good of the country, to step back from the brink, to step back from brinksmanship on this debt ceiling. Let's not panic. We're going to be on this planet for a while. Let's have some confidence in ourselves to do this in a smart, thoughtful way so that our children will say, well, 
They might not have been the greatest generation, but they are a pretty good generation. 